Why would you violate the law God gave you eight chapters earlier and you said cool to and now here you are all of a sudden and you've given up on God? As a matter of fact, how do you make a God? Would you join with me in a reading of God's holy word as we seek to hear what God would speak in our present day? I want to invite you to the Old Testament, to the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. If you journey with me to the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus, there is a disturbing account in the history of the people of God that speaks volumes to us today. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse number one. If I can have a little more volume on the monitors, please. Exodus chapter 32. I want to begin reading in verse number one out of the New King James Version of God's Holy Word. The word of the Lord declares, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together Aaron and they said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. I want to talk, teach, preach this morning. So they made a God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So they made a God. Throughout the history of Christianity, there have always been some moments and movements led by scholars, theologians, clergymen to somewhat diminish and devalue the Old Testament. There are those who believe that the Christological focus of the New Testament with the covenant of grace that offers salvation freely to all, holds more value in the life of a believer than the Old Testament record of Israel as a chosen people in a relationship with God that is signed and sealed by law. To those who believe that what you read in the New Testament of grace has successfully replaced and repealed what one sees in the laws of the Old Testament. And they would argue that, that as a born-again Christian believer, you ought to begin your journey with God in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Beloved, before you put too much weight and merit in that theology, allow me to suggest to you that there is something valuable in the Old Testament, that when you read it, it ought to have some resonance with you because it sounds like a familiar story. The Old Testament is the story of the relationship of a faithful God with some unfaithful people. It's a story of a God who continues to find ways to be good to folk who continuously find ways to be bad. It's the story of a God who loves some folk that the truth be told ain't really worth loving. It's the story of a God who is merciful to some people who always find new ways to mess up. It's the problematic story of a relationship of a God who goes exceedingly and abundantly above what they deserve for folk 
who can come to church and never say thank you. It's a story of a God who, who wants to take them to Louis Vuitton down on East 57. But they prefer the knockoffs from the flea market on West 39th. It's, it's a story of a people who, who run to God when they need something, but run from God when God expects something from them. A, a people who want God to do everything while they do nothing in return. The reason you ought to hang out in the Old Testament every now and then is because that ought to sound like a familiar story. That's not just the story of antiquity. That, beloved, is our story. Because we, like the children of Israel, continuously and creatively find ways to stray from God. We are people who continuously and creatively find ways to hurt and harm one another. We continuously and creatively find ways to damage and disrespect the earth that God has put us on. We continuously and creatively find ways to let God down. No matter how big your Bible is this Sunday, no matter how Baptist beautiful you may be dressed up, no matter how many tongues you talk in, if the truth be told, all of us like sheep have wandered and gone astray. If, if, if your neighbor hadn't even looked a man, nudge him and tell him he's talking about you. Because all of us have found ways to be unfaithful with a God who is everything but that with us. And here's why the Old Testament ought to make you shout. Because when God is justified to act with a hand of wrath, his hand of wrath is stayed by his heart of mercy. That, that we serve a God who would be justified in raining down fire and brimstone on us every day. But because he is merciful, you've never reaped everything you've sown. Because he's merciful, you woke up on Sunday despite Saturday night sin. Because he's merciful, he's blessed you with some stuff you don't deserve. Now, now, I know there's some folk on your pew that ain't never sinned. They can spell sin without an I in the middle. So I'm not talking to you. I want to talk to some folk that so enough know you've let God down. I want to see some folk who know you done so enough messed up that you've been as ratchet and as trifling as ratchet can be. But God is merciful and God has shielded you from what you know you deserve. I'm looking for some Psalm 136 saints who walk into church saying, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. Somebody who woke up to mercy. Somebody who's worshiping because of mercy. Somebody who's alive because of mercy. God is a merciful God it, it shouldn't take a whole lot to make you get happy in church everybody said you know you ought to think about how good God has been no let me tell you what ought to make you shout not how good God has been what ought to make you shout is how low you've been how sinful you've been how unrighteous you've been and God woke you up anyway so when you wake up in mercy somebody ought to say this is the day that the Lord has made there's something about mercy that ought to move the believer that that's that's really what we see in this here chapter of Exodus. By the time you get to Exodus 32, some things have happened that you're already familiar with. You've been to Sunday school. You, you saw the Prince of Egypt. You know the Ten Commandments. You, you've seen it. 
children of Israel start off as slaves. The Bible says that God hears their cry because we serve a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. God decides to deliver Israel out of Egypt, raises up a man named Moses. Moses goes to Pharaoh, he only got one sermon. God told me to tell you, let my people go. Pharaoh ain't trying to hear it. Pharaoh doesn't want them to go, so God engages in 10 visible signs called plagues that convinces Pharaoh. That 10th plague is the death angel that snatches the life of everything that ain't covered by the blood. That's a good sermon right there. And when Pharaoh sees the power of God, Pharaoh tells the children of Israel this. He said, listen, y'all ain't got to go home. But you got to get up out of here. They leave. God opens the Red Sea. God closes the Red Sea on Pharaoh. They get to the other side. They shout and they rejoice. And then God speaks through Moses to give Israel some commandments. God said, look, listen, I didn't just bring you out for nothing. Here's what he says. I am the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. And because I brought you out of Egypt, because I delivered you, because I've carried you, this is what I expect from you. Number one, you shall have no other God other than me. Number two, you shall not make any golden image of any other God. Are we clear? In chapter 24, Israel responds to God's commandment like this. In the Howard John Wesley translation, Israel says, cool. No other God, no golden images. We got it. At the end of chapter 24, Moses is now called up to the mountain with God because God wants to give Moses the entirety of the law. God says now, now that Israel has agreed to the contract, now that they know I'm God, no other God, no golden images, let me write down the entire law on stone tablets and Moses, you go back and you tell the people this is what God wants. So from chapter 24, to chapter 31, Moses is on the mountain getting the law. And in chapter 32, all hell breaks loose. Moses has been gone too long. So the people decide we need to do something. So the people have a meeting and they go to Aaron <laughs> where my key and pill saints uh, they go to Aaron and they say listen make us a God so they made a God They were wondering if God was still with them. So they made a God. They wanted something they could see and worship. So they made a God. They were wondering who was going to lead them forward. So they made a God. Moses had been gone too long, so they made a God. Why would you trade the God who brought you out of Egypt for a God you made? Why would you want to worship a God you made and not the God who made you? Why would you violate the law God gave you eight chapters earlier and you said cool to and now here you are all of a sudden and you've given up on God? As a matter of fact, 
How do you make a God? How do human hands make a God? Why, why do they make a God? Moses is gone. Moses is on the mountain with the Lord. Moses is getting the law. And I'll suggest to you that these children of Israel have found something out. That whenever Moses is alone with God, he always comes back with law. <laughs> that whenever Moses spends time with God, the end result is some more do and do not. Every time Moses is gone, he comes back telling us how we can and cannot act in this thing with God. First time he was gone, came back with these Ten Commandments. Came back with these rules about worship and Sabbath and feasts and altars. Came back with these commandments about property and money. Came back with these laws about how we treat folk. Came back with expectations. God expects you to be kind to strangers. God expects you to take care of the poor. God expects you to love your enemy. God expects you not to lie on one another. God expects you not to take chartered fights with taxpayer money. God expects some things of you. Every time Moses comes back, more law from God. And if these folk are like the folks sitting on your pew, Nobody likes to be told what to do. They found out this God doesn't just deliver us. He demands some things of us. This God doesn't just love us. He's got some laws for us. This God is not one who just sits back and says you can do whatever you want to do. This God has commandment. This God has regulation. This God has codes of holiness. This God has expectation. This God says, this is what I want from you. This God blesses us and then demands that we do what he says we ought to do. Could it be that they made a God? Because a God you create is a God you control. That we want to make another God who lets us do what we want to do. We're tired of this God with all the shall and shall not. We want another God. So when they make this God, you keep reading in chapter 32 by verse number 6. After they make the God, this is what they did. They ate, they drank, and they played. Because now we got a God that lets us eat, drink, and play. Beloved, I suggest to you that in making this God, their attempt is not to make a God. Their attempt is to take control of their own life. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want some God laying down laws. I don't want to deny myself. I want to eat. I want to drink. And I want to play. And I prefer eating, drinking, playing God than the God that tells me how I ought to live my life and what I cannot do and what is restricted on my list and behaviors that are displeasing to him. All of a sudden, I need a God that lets me do what I want to do. And when they made a God, what they really made was themselves God. That inherent in the human heart is the desire to do what you want to do, to live your life the way you want to live it, 
to believe that nobody should tell you what you can and cannot do. And so when they made a God, they in essence made themselves God. We will determine what is right. We will do what we want to do. We will live how we want to live. We shall act the way we want to act. How do you make a God? When you make yourself God. Now, now, I know there won't be a, a big amen here, but allow me to tell you that the worst God you can make for yourself, go help me preach it then, yeah, is yourself. But, but beloved, I, I know if, if you're millennial minded, this sermon ain't going to hit you right now. But on behalf of us who can see 50 coming or got 50 in the rear view mirror, allow some seasoned folk to tell you that the older you get in life, the more you recognize you don't know what the hell you doing, that you don't know everything, that your ways are not always right, your dreams are not always right, your desires are not always right, your wants are not always right, and you need a God who is bigger than you and wiser than you to lay down the law of how you ought to live your life. Can I help somebody? Your vision is too small to be God. Your understanding is too limited to be God. Your hands are too weak to be God. Your dreams are too selfish to be God. Your power is too finite to be God. Your being is too weak. You need a God that sees more and knows more and is all about what's best for you. Okay, 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 okay. I, I can see I got some stubborn saints. Um, I, have, I have a favorite app on my phone called Waze. Uh, W-A-Z-E. Uh, Waze is a GPS on your phone. Um, you, it, it tells you where you are. Uh, you plug in where you want to go. And Waze will take you the best way to get there and avoid traffic so you don't waste time in your life. Because uh, it's a global positioning satellite that sees. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm coming back from a board meeting at Virginia Union um, the other week, the pastor that rode down with me is riding back. And we get in the car, and if you've ever driven from Richmond to Alexandria, you know it's really not complicated. Get on 95 North and step on the gas. 90 miles later, you will be in Alexandria. It's real simple. Just get on 95 North and step on the gas. So, Marcia, we get in the car, we're in Richmond. We get on 95 North, and I plug in Waze. And I put in the address of the church. And the preacher next to me looked at me and wondered, why are you turning on Waze when all we got to do is get on 95 North and head straight? I said, because Waze sees some things that we can't see. Waze knows where the police are hiding out. Waze knows where there's traffic jams. Waze knows where there's debris in the road that are causing an accident. So I'm listening to Waze. We're driving up 95 North. 10 miles outside of Occoquan. No traffic. Waze says, get off and go Route 1. I don't see a thing of traffic. I get off and get on Route 1. Preacher looks at me and says, why are you getting on Route 1 and not saying on that? Because Waze <laughs> told me to get off and go up Route 1. We're driving up Route 1. We turn on 103.5. Uh -huh. Weather and traffic on the 8th. <laughs> the traffic says that there was a recent accident at the mile mark of Occoquan and traffic was starting to back up. And Waze saw it happening before I did. So Waze told me to get off so I could avoid wasting time in my day in an accident that I didn't have no part of. If you can trust 
weighs on your phone. Can I tell you about some other ways by a God who sees your life and tells you what direction to go? The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Somebody holler, trust his ways. They, they make a God because they really want to be in control of their own lives. Because this God we serve has expectation. He's got law. He's got commandments. He's got restrictions. But you can't be your own God. So they go to Aaron and they say, make us a God. Aaron tells them, give me the gold from your earrings. Now, why does Aaron ask for the gold? Because Aaron and all these Israelites have been raised in Egypt. And Egyptian culture has taught them that if you're going to make an image of a god, it's got to be made in gold. One does not make gods out of wood. You cannot paper mache a god. If it's going to be any kind of god, it has to be made out of gold. And so the Bible says they take the gold and give it to Aaron. Now, the reason they make a God is because now they have the resources and the wealth to do so. Say with me. When they were slaves, they didn't have any gold. And now they've got resource and wealth to make a God. When they were slaves, they didn't have no gold. Now they've been upgraded. Now former slaves got some gold. Former slaves have mutual funds. Former slaves have position and title. Former slaves, they, they don't have to walk in the back door of a hotel. They go in the front door and stay at hotels so nice, you can't even put the towels in your suitcase. They, 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 they've been upgraded. No more Ben, Buick Ben. This ain't Payless. These is red bottom shoes. <laughs> Your neighbor don't listen to 1041. They just they, they, they they've been upgraded. And now they take gold and make a God. Now, if I haven't lost you yet, there ought to be a question you're asking. Where did they get the gold from? How did former slaves get gold? Well, the Bible says in Exodus 12, when God is getting ready to lead them out of Egypt, God moves upon Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh says, y'all can take whatever you can hold. And so the gold is a result of God's favor. I came by to ask you a question. With your red bottom shoes and your Gucci and your custom made suit, where did your gold come from? Where did your position come from? Where did your income come from? Now I know some of you thought it's cause you went to school so I ain't preaching to you. I want to preach to some folk who know 
that whatever gold I got is because of the favor and the grace and the mercy of my God. Hey, God gave this to me. God made a way for me. God opened doors for me. This, this, this gold came from God. Now watch the irony. So they want to take the gold God gave and make it their God. Because life is filled with people who make gold their God. Who put their trust in their income. Who put their faith in their strength, who put their confidence in their title. Now, now, if you're millennial minded, that might make sense. But on behalf of us who see 50 coming or got 50 in the rear view mirror, allow us to testify that there are some things gold can't do for you. Can I preach right here? Money cannot answer your prayers. Position can't save your marriage. Title will not heal you of cancer. There are some things gold can't do. And they have made the mistake of believing that the gold God gave them is now the God that will lead them. So, so Walter Brueggemann helped me. He said, listen, here's the problem. They have never seen God. So what they want to do is make a God they can see. They're wondering if God is going to be with them. So they make a God they can see to know that God is with them. They're doubting if God is real. So they made a God so that they could know God was real. So watch what they do. This is deep. They take the gold, they put it in their hand, and they hand it to Aaron. And Aaron takes gold out of their hand to make a God they can see. They're wondering if God is real while they've got gold in their hand. They're doubting if the Lord will provide, but they've got gold in their hand. They're wondering if God will still answer prayer, but baby, you got gold in your hand. And here is the lesson that if you can't see God you can see what he's done that when I doubt if he's real all I gotta do is look at what God has put in my hand I wish I had some gold carrying saints who know that God has blessed me God has put some stuff in my life and I know that I know that I know that God must be real. Look at what's in my hand. Uh, when you doubt God, look at what's in your hand. When you wonder if he'll provide, look at what's in your hand. They, they made a God because they want to be in control. They made a God because they're putting their faith in material and monetary possessions. And the Bible says, watch this, it's good. They made a God because Moses had been gone too long. Because they didn't know where Moses was, they wondered where God was. This is dangerous to preach in the church, but Moses, Earl, had been lifted 
to a place Moses shouldn't have been lifted to. Because they believed that the absence of Moses signaled the absence of God. It's dangerous when you lift up Moses too high. So that when Moses is going to watch this land, they, they, they don't want a vice Moses. They think they need a God. Because they can't find Moses, they don't look for an interim Moses. They think they need a God. They have mistakenly elevated Moses to be equal with God. And now that Moses is gone, they think God is gone. And they need another God because God left with Moses. Beloved, the danger in allowing someone else to be God is that life has a way of taking Moses from you. And when Moses is gone, you have to know that God is still there. When Moses has been called home to be with the Lord, you've got to know that God is still there. When Moses breaks your heart and doesn't want to walk with you no more, you've got to know that God is still there. When Moses can't run for office anymore and you're stuck with Aaron, you've got to know that God is still there. When Moses isn't preaching, You got to know there's still a word from the Lord that you can receive because it's not Moses, it's God. So watch what they've done and I'm done now. So they say, we don't know what happened to Moses, comma, the man who brought us out of Egypt. You think Moses brought you out of Egypt? You you saw the waters of the Red Sea open and you thought that was Moses? You saw water come out of a rock and you thought that was Moses? You got manna from heaven and you think that was Moses? You were bitten by snakes and didn't die. And you think that's Moses? Beloved, there's somebody today who can look at everything you've come through. Every way that's been made. Every blessing that came your way. Every protection. And you can declare without a shadow of a doubt, that ain't Moses. I'm looking for some folk that know it wasn't your boo. It wasn't your babe, it wasn't your mama, it wasn't your daddy. Is there anybody here who knows it was the Lord who made a way out of no way? It was the Lord who protected me on my way. It was the Lord who answered my prayer. And when I think of what the Lord has done, the ways he's made, the prayers he's answered, the doors he's opened. I will bless that Lord because that's the God that walks with me and talks with me. That's the God that held me and made ways for me. Is there anybody here that knows it was God? It's, it wasn't if you're able to stand would you do so? Listen, it's not some person that took care of you. It was the true living God. So today in this moment, I want to ask you a question. It's a probing one. Don't answer too quickly. Who is your God? Have you made yourself God? Are you trusting in financial gain? 
is your faith in someone else. And God says all of those are golden images. For none of those brought you out of Egypt. None of those provided for you. None of those have taken care of you. There is but one true and living God. And he calls us to surrender to his ways. To live our life in faithful relationship with him. A surrendered heart. Somebody today, I want you to know the joy of letting go and letting God be in control of your life. You can't be your God.